I couldn't wait to ask the pastors from our church just one question. Uh, The five of us had gathered around a conference room table to discuss an upcoming sermon series like we always did. And and this time the series we were discussing was this one, a series on the book of Job. Uh, A series about pain and suffering, about the hard times we go through in life, how we deal with it together. And the question I couldn't wait to ask the other pastors of our church was this. What do you guys do? Like when someone from our church, when, when one of you comes to one of us, when life has gone from good to not so good to really, really bad, you know, when you pour out your heart, when, when the tears start to fall, I wanted to ask our pastors, what do you do? Like, what do you say when you grab your Bible? What page do you turn to? How, how do you try to help people who are hurting? You know, one of the really cool, uh, really amazing, and really humbling parts of what we do is that people tend to come to us, to the church, and to pastors normally when times are really, really good or when they're really, really not. Right? Like, we conceived, we're going to have a baby, we're going to start a family. Like, let's tell the pastor, let's pray about that. Or when we can't have kids, when we lost a baby, when there's been a miscarriage. People tell the pastors about that. When a relationship has gone from this is something special to like this is the thing, can we have a wedding, would would you speak? People call the pastor. Or when things really get bad and someone drops the D word and there's maybe a separation, a divorce, they, they call the pastor. When there's some celebration, they call the pastor. When it's cancer, they call the pastor. We, we get to ride the roller coaster with you of the ups and downs of life. And so I, I wanted to ask these guys, when it's not the ups, but it's the downs, what do you do? Right? I'm the guy who's pretty good at the ups. The, the Bible passages about joy, it's just how I'm wired. I'm, I'll quote Dumb and Dumber or Anchorman, we'll have a good time together. But like, when, when it dips here, I, I kind of feel like emotionally incompetent. What, what do you say? And I know the Bible, I could come up with like an intellectual, good biblical answer that applies, but that, that's not always how you help people, right? It's about the emotional IQ, knowing what to say and how to say it and how often to say it. And so I, I asked the pastors, uh, what do you do? And while I'm thinking about that, maybe I can ask you the same question. What, what do you do? You don't have to be a a trained pastor in theology to walk with someone in one of these moments of life. So when one of your friends or the girl that you're dating or your mom, your dad, your roommates, like when they come to you with a breakup, with, with grandpa's death, with the, the cancer, the, the miscarriage, like when, when they kind of pour out all of, of their hurt and then they stop and it's your turn What do you do? It happens to all of us, right? Life on this world is filled with joys and sorrows. And if we don't just live in a cave by ourselves, it involves doing life with people in their joys and their sorrows. So that, that's kind of a big question I want to pose today. What, what do you personally do? What have you seen that works? What doesn't? What helps? How do you react if you're a person of faith? What, what do you say about about God and about Jesus and about the Bible? What chapter, what verse do you turn to? What, what do you do in the midst of brokenness and pain? You know, I was actually trying to think through my own experience, hundreds of conversations like that. What, what have I tended to do? What sometimes work? And I came up with uh, my own top 10 list. So if you're taking notes uh, at home or here in church, you want to grab a pen, here are what I think are the top 10 things that people like us do when people we love are dealing with pain. I'll recite them fast, so right quickly. Number one, I think sometimes we just be. Right, just, just be there. You don't, you don't have to quote the prophet Isaiah. Sometimes when you just show up, you give someone a hug, you're physically present. That's such a great gift to go through one of those moments and not go through it alone. You could just be. Or number two, maybe you could say sorry. I'm so sorry you're going through this. Uh, when I heard the news, I was, I was devastated. I, I can't believe this happened. Sometimes, like, just that emotion, that's technically what, what sympathy is. In Greek, the word 
Pathi means emotion or suffering. Sim means with, like a symphony as sounds put together. When you like line up your emotion with theirs, that, that feels so good sometimes to go through that together. You could just be, you could say sorry, or number three, you could, you could share a story. I don't think I've ever told you this, but did you know that my grandpa died when I was just your age? The whole world doesn't know this, but I actually went through two miscarriages too. I, I know what that feels like. And when people realize like they're not the first to go through it and like somehow you've gotten through it, it gives them hope for the future. Number four, you could offer help. Have you ever heard of like the casserole crew after a funeral? <laughs> All right, filling up freezers. Like we don't know what to do, so we make food, we drop it off on the doorstep. How, how about I watch the kids? How about I just give you a day to yourself? How about I show up? How, how about I clean the house? I know you're just not, you're not what you normally are. You could offer help. Or number five, you could offer hope. You could say, I, I know right now this feels like it's never, ever going to get better. You're never going to get over missing him. And you'll always miss him, but, but time will heal wounds. I used to be where you are and, and God got, got me through it. I've learned great lessons from it. Like this isn't, isn't the end of the story. This feeling won't endure forever. You could offer hope. Or number six, you could offer a bit of silver lining. Right? It's, it's bad, but there's still something good. Like you could grumble about what you've lost, but there's really something even in this moment to be grateful for. I, I sometimes say this when I'm at a funeral and it's packed, right? I just want to say, man, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss, but this is incredible. Your, your dad was so loved. You, your grandma impacted so much. Like look around and see the, the value and the impact that this life made. Or if you're a Christian person, you could think like I think and you could wonder, what, what should I preach? Right? Like what truth should I share from this book that could give some spiritual healing? So number seven, you could preach about God's plans. Right? God has a plan for this. It's painful, but for Christians, pain is never pointless. The devil loves to take away and God loves to flip it for the good of his people. There are passages like, I know the plans I have for you, Isaiah chapter 29. In all things, God is working for the good of those who love him, Romans chapter 8. The whole universe is underneath the feet of Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1. God is gonna, God's gonna use this. You can't see it, and I don't know exactly why, but God has promised it is never, ever, ever pointless. You could preach that. Or number eight, my favorite, you could preach God's presence. God, like leave the caps lock on. God, the best thing about your life, he is still present. And, and you lost the baby, but you, you did not lose God. Your husband walked out the door, but Jesus is a better husband and he will never leave or forsake his church. Your friend disappointed you, betrayed you, moved to the other side of the country. Jesus is the friend who said, I will be with you Always, right? You might lose many things in this life, but if you are a Christian, there's one thing you never, ever, ever, ever have to wonder about losing. It's the presence of a glorious God. And I'm going to move on to number nine, or I'm going to preach about that for about 15 more minutes. Um, you could also, number nine, preach God's sympathy. Uh, there's some interesting passages in the book of Hebrews that say, because Jesus was human, because he walked among us on this very same planet for 33 years, he, he knows what it's like. Right? Has the system failed you? Jesus knows. H have you lost someone you, you care about? Jesus knows. Have you wept? Jesus did. Have you been betrayed? Jesus was too. Are you in physical pain? Jesus too. Has the church disappointed you? Jesus too. Has your family disappointed you? Jesus too. Like when you pray to Jesus about your pain, he, he nods because he knows. He knows exactly what it's like to feel how you feel because he felt it first. Or tenth and finally, you could preach God's salvation. Uh, you could tell your loved one, hey, listen, because of Jesus, the story will not end this way. Eternity is like a thousand foot rope and the Bible says the pain you're going through is like one 
little inch of black tape on that rope. Like, it's hard now, and it might not get better tomorrow, but the Bible says Jesus is coming back to save his people from sorrow and death and mourning and grief and pain. We are forgiven now, and we will not have to struggle forever. You could preach God's salvation. So, what do you think about my list? As you look it over, could you maybe circle one of the things that you kind of default to when you're face-to-face with pain? Are there, are there two or three that's like kind of your, your roadmap for helping people who are suffering? As you think about that, though, I, I want to suggest one complicating factor that many of the things on the same list can backfire. Have you noticed that? Like, it's a good thing on paper, it's a, a great place, but depending who you're talking to and what their emotional state is in the moment, something that might be really good for one person is really, really not so good for another person. Right? Maybe a, a yellow flag in your brain went up when I said, offer silver lining. Hey, your husband's dead, but look at all the people at his funeral, isn't that great? <laughs> Right? That can backfire. That can be really insensitive. Sometimes God's plans can backfire. You know, a person is just empty. They've, they've lost a child. The closest person they loved is gone. They're going back to that bed to sleep in it all alone. God has plans and someone might like lash out and say, well, what kind of God is this that would have plans to make me feel like that? If I'm his child, why, why would he let that happen? You could try to share your story and someone could throw that back. Like, you don't, you don't know what I'm going through. You did that, but this is so much worse. Uh, I've kind of realized after 40 years of life and 14 years of being a pastor, it's, it's complicated and it's messy and there's no perfect script and there's no page in the Bible that says, step one, say this. Step two, do that. And so there's this tension, isn't there? All of us end up in these conversations with people who are feeling incredible pain. All of us want to do something good and helpful and very few of us know exactly what that helpful thing to do is. And that's why I'm excited to preach to you today. Next week, I'm going to try to cover 35 chapters of the book of Job in one sermon. Bring extra coffee, cancel plans after church. (laughs) Uh, Today, though, I'm not going to preach 35 chapters. I'm not even going to preach one chapter or a half a chapter. I'm going to just preach on three little verses from the end of Job chapter 2. Because this tension that we feel today, it's not the first time. Uh, Many, many years ago, there was this guy named Job. His life went from good to bad to unthinkably bad. And at the very end of Job chapter 2, his friends show up and, and they try to deal with this situation that we all deal with. Like, they're, they're good friends. They care about Job. What will they do? What will they say? Uh, today, we're going to take a peek at what these friends did, and we're going to think about what we can do for each other when moments like this turn into moments like that. So, if you have a Bible or a phone in your hand, you can open up to Job chapter 2. Otherwise, you can follow along on the screen because we're going to begin today with Job chapter 2, verse 11, which says this. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, sweet names, aren't they? Anyone pregnant here today? You need some baby names? (laughs) Write that down. (laughs) Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, when they heard about all the troubles that had come upon Job, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. Let's pause there. Um, These guys, based on that one verse, are amazing friends. Right? This isn't like Facebook friends, I click the button and I guess we're, we're close now. I mean, think for a second about what these guys did. It says, when they heard about Job's troubles, they set out from their homes. Right? So that implies, we're not quite sure how far they traveled to get to Job. They left their families, their friends, their jobs, their, their to-do list, maybe their kids, their beds, their comfort. We're going to find out that they're going to spend more than a week of personal time off 
to try to be a friend to their broken friend named Job. Like these are ride or die, stand up next to you at your wedding, carry the casket at your funeral kind of friends. They care so much about Job, the text says, they met together by agreement. Right? It's like, we, we got to do something. What, what are we going to do? I, I don't know. Let's get together. Let's brainstorm. Let's come up with some plan because Job is at the bottom and he needs us right now. Right? Job didn't invite them. He didn't say, you guys got to come. They just knew because this is what great friends do that Job needed help. And according to the same verse, when they met together by agreement, they came up with three goals. You see that in the text? First of all, their goal was to go. Goal number two, to sympathize. And goal number three, to comfort. Right? They said, we got to go. Right? I mean, sometimes sending a text, Snapchat message, writing a letter, FaceTime video, sometimes that works, but sometimes you just got to go. Sometimes you're close enough to that person and the relationship is there where, where you just physically have to be at the funeral. A digital hug is nice. An actual hug is about a thousand times better. Right? We got to go, they said. Number two, they said, we got to go because we need to sympathize with Job. Uh, the Hebrew word used here for sympathize literally means to do this. To, to move to and fro, right? It's like when someone shares terrible news with you and you, you just instinctively, your heart shakes your head like, no, oh man. They said, we, we got to show Job that th this is so bad. It, it's so, this is not the way that life is supposed to be. We want to sympathize with him. We want to mirror his emotions. And then finally, number three, they said, we, we want to go to comfort him. Like his comfort level went from this to here to like here and and they couldn't bring back Job's deceased children. They, they couldn't cure all of his illnesses, but somehow they wanted to say something or do something to make him just a, you know, 1% more comfortable. Let's go. Let's sympathize. Let's comfort him. Those were the three goals of these three incredible friends. Oh, it makes me think of some of my friends. Uh, about a month ago, I was at a middle school volleyball game and uh, one of my classmates, who's a pastor here in our town, said, did you hear about Nate? I had no clue. But I found out that one of our, our classmates, 40 years old, pastor over in Kansas, he had actually died of COVID. 40. Like, j just like that, gone. Uh, married not that long ago. Four kids, ages seven and under. And I, like, I can't imagine his wife waking up, right? Four kids needing attention. And then I heard what some of his friends did. Nate was blessed with, with a lot of friends. I was maybe in his second circle, but like his inner circle, the, the guys he had known long before he met me, that he went to high school with and college with and seminary with, they did exactly what Job's friends did. They, they met together digitally. They said, what are we going to do? And they said, we got to go. He's like, pastors leaving behind churches and families and children and jobless. They took personal time off. They piled into a couple of cars in Wisconsin. They drove 600 miles over to Kansas just to go and to sympathize and to comfort. They hugged the recent widow. They spoke words of, of grace and Jesus to these little kids. They actually formed a choir and they stood up and they, they sang about God's glory and the beauty of heaven at this man's funeral. They couldn't fix it. They couldn't bring Nate back, but they were friends. And this is what friends do. They physically go, they emotionally sympathize, and they verbally comfort. So, let me ask you. Is there someone in your life right now who needs you to do the same thing? I'm choosing that word carefully, like needs. Uh, every week in my planning journal, I write myself a, a question. Mike, who needs a pastor? Right. Sometimes a pastor is nice. 
hey, let, let's catch up, let's grab some coffee, w- would you pray for me? Can you answer this question about the Bible? Sometimes that's nice, but sometimes you just, you need it, right? It's like as, as bad as life has been in a long time. So let me ask you that question. Who, who needs you right now? If I gave you five seconds of silence, like could you think of a, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, who's maybe dealing with one of the the killer D's, disease, death, divorce, or depression? Here's the deal. They need you. Like, they might not have the words to tell you, they might be embarrassed to ask you, But when people hit bottom, when humans hit bottom, they need you. Do you know what Jesus himself said, God in human flesh, the night before he died? He went to a garden to pray and he said to his friends, stay with me. Like, I I am so overwhelmed with sorrow. Jesus said, stay, I need you. And your friends need you too. You might not know how to fix it. You might not know which thing's on the list. Like your plan might not be perfect, but, but they need you. So I want to urge you. I want to like pastorally just push you. Like just go, right? <laughs> just, just show up. Bring a casserole. <laughs> send a text. Give them a heads up. It might be messy. It might be imperfect. But the fact is we, we need each other in moments like that. How good and pleasant it is, the Bible says, when people live together in unity. If one person lies down alone, how sad, but where two are there together, how good, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says. So, brainstorm with a couple of friends, meet together by agreement, come up with your own plan to go, to sympathize, and to comfort. Because here is what I have learned. These are the moments in life that people remember. Right? When, when we are just like husband left, dad died, baby's lost, breakup, got fired, mental illness, when, when people just show up, like that's the stuff that sticks with us, doesn't it? People don't remember what you cooked. <laughs> they probably won't remember what Bible passage you quoted. But the fact that you were there when they just needed someone to be there, I hear that all the time. You know, pastor, 15 years ago, I went through this, but my pastor at the time just showed up, like every, every week he called, and no one remembers what he says, but he was there, right? So, I want to encourage you today, this is not just a sermon you hear and say, that was nice, I'm going to fill in the blanks now. Like, God is telling you, go, 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 they, they need you. Here's my big idea if you're taking notes. Uh, after a tragedy, community is a necessity. After tragedy, community is a necessity. It's it's not nice. It's what we need. Just like Jesus. All right, so what comes next? These three friends came up with their three goals, their plan. Let's jump back into Job chapter 2 and see what happens next. Verse 12. When they... The three friends saw him, Job, from a distance. They could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Can you imagine what, what Job must have looked like? I mean, how, how, bad, how bad of a state are you in when your best, best friends see you and they don't speak a word? I actually was reading some Bible commentaries on this chapter and one pastor had actually read through the book of Job and he had highlighted every physical thing that Job was dealing with. And I never knew this. I want to share with you his list. He said that Job's suffering included, quote, inflamed ulcerous sores, Persistent itching, disfiguration, loss of appetite, here's my favorite, 
worm-infested skin that burst open, scabbed over, cracked, oozed, and pussed, difficulty breathing, foul breath, loss of weight, high fever, chills, diarrhea, depression, anxiety, and excruciating continual pain. That's what they saw. And they couldn't say a word. They didn't even recognize him. Like, where's Job? And a neighbor must have said, you just saw him. And so they tear their robes like Job tore his. They sprinkle dust on their heads like Job shaved his own head. And they just sit down on the ground for seven days. They don't go back home. They don't get a nice hotel room. They just sit with their friend for seven straight days. And what do they do? The text says, No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Hmm. What do you think about that? Let me give you a quiz. You won't be graded. The cameras aren't recording you. (laughs) Do you think the fact that Job's closest friends didn't say a word for seven days, do you think that was a good way to help their hurting friend? Or a bad way to help their hurting friend. You gotta vote on three. Ready? You gotta pick one. One, two, three. I see goods. I see a couple bads. I I'm like this. <laughs> I mean, some people think this is good. In fact, in Jewish culture, when you to this day walk into the home of someone who's suffering, you don't speak first. Like you don't impose your conversation upon them. You wait for them to speak and you see where they're at. Right? And the fact, I mean, that Job had lost. I mean, when 10 of your children, all of your children are gone, what, what exactly do you say? God has a plan for you? No, it's, maybe it's brilliant that they just sat there and they just were with him. And if you know about the 35 chapters that are about to come in the book of Job, once these men open their mouth, it all goes off the tracks, right? They're trying to explain like why this would happen. They start to say, man, Maybe Job, maybe Job, you're not as good as everyone thought. The conversation explodes into the, the longest argument between four men that you've ever read in the Bible in your entire life. So maybe the best thing these guys could do was just, just weep. Just sit on the ground with this broken man. But other people, including some pretty great theologians and Bible commentators, they say, imagine if you were Job. Like if, if you were in some like car wreck, everyone that you loved in the car was gone, you were hooked up to tubes and I came to see you in the hospital and I, I saw you there and you saw me and I just wept and I sat down and I held your hand. If I did that for an hour, you'd be like, what a pastor. If I did that for a day, you'd be like, his hand is kind of sweaty. <laughs> if I sat by your side for a week, and didn't say a word, I mean, would that be awkward? <laughs> I'm thinking like, well, say something. Like, what, what, what are you thinking? And so th- there's this great debate. Like, are these, is this the best thing the friends ever did? Is this the most awkward, insensitive things the friends ever did? And I actually love the fact that there's some ambiguity here because here's the second big idea I want to share with you today. Write this down. That after tragedy, community is messy. Right? It, it, it just is. When people are hurting, when we walk into a conversation that is filled with pain, it's not clear cut, it's not black and white, it is so, so messy. Like, do you walk into the room and say something? Maybe? Do you stick around because she's going to need so much help after the death of the one she loved? Maybe? Does she want some space for you and some privacy to mourn? Maybe. Do you ask a question like, hey, if you, if you need any help, text me, okay? Maybe. Is asking a person who just can't think straight to come up with a list of good things to do the right thing to do? Maybe. Do you open a Bible and just share your own story and testimony? Maybe. Is it the wrong time to share that? Maybe. Do you remind a person that God is powerful and he's going to work this for their good just like the Bible says? Maybe. Will someone be mad at God in that moment? Maybe. When someone in their pain says something about God that's not biblically true, 
when the question is love and his plans, do you become like the theologian hawk? You like swoop in, correct them so the lie doesn't grow in their hearts? Maybe. Do you just understand that hurt people say things they don't mean? Probably. Like, what, what do you do? And the Bible's answer is, you, you try. <laughs> it's messy. After tragedy, community is a necessity. We need people. But the reality is community is also messy. Those people are going to walk in the room and it's not going to be perfect. So let me make, make two quick applications before I say amen. Uh, number one, if you are the friend today, like when I gave you a little bit of time and space to think about someone who's hurting, if like the answer came quick and you're like, yep, I, I got to reach out, I, I got to go. If you're the friend today, here's my advice to you. Expect messy. Right? Like ditch the perfectionist mindset that doesn't work ever in life. But especially in these moments, it does not work. Just expect it to be messy. Expect that you're going to mess up. Expect that you're going to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. In fact, I think it would be brilliant if you would say to your hurting friend, hey, listen, I I really don't know what to do. (laughs) And I have a hunch I'm going to say something that I don't intend to hurt you, but it might happen. If that happens or when that happens, just please know that I realize I am not perfect, but I do want to be present. All right, if, if I say something I don't see, t- tell me, please, I'll do my best to correct it, but I don't want you to go through this season of life alone. Expect it to be messy. And know when you're driving home or you're holding your phone, waiting for them to text back and you're beating yourself up because you feel guilty that you said this or you should have said that or you didn't say that. I mean, here's the beauty about being a Christian. There's always Jesus. There's a Jesus who died on the cross to forgive every sin, including the sins we don't intend. Uh, Jesus is the Savior whose blood cleans up the mess so that we don't have to live with guilt and think we're so stupid for saying the wrong thing when a person needed us most. Christianity says we can repent, which means we can confess our sins, and then we can know that he always does. Right? The the rock-solid foundation that we have as we go through this is the constant love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So, do something. Go somewhere, help someone, expect it to be messy. I know that Jesus always cleans up the mess. Second, if as I've been teaching today, you you haven't felt like the friends, but you've kind of felt like Job. If my examples of of disease or death, divorce or depression, like that's, that's what you're going through right now, here's my advice to you. Expect Messy. I wish your friends and family were Jesus. They ain't. (laughs) All right? They're sinful people and their sins are sometimes going to happen at the worst times. I told some of you a few weeks ago that just after I was born, uh, my parents had another child. Uh, the, The child Jimmy was sick. He died at just six weeks old. My mom called the pastor And the pastor's wife picked up. And you know the first thing she said to my mom? Praise Jesus! Wrong answer. There is a time to praise Jesus, but there is just a time to not speak. She messed up. Because she's a person. And and people are going to mess up. They're going to disappoint you. You're going to wish that they showed up and they didn't. You're going to wish that they would just give you some space and they won't. you're going to wish they would stop blowing up your phone because you just need, you need silence. You're going to wish as you stare at your phone that someone would reach out and they won't. Like, they can't read hearts. They can't read minds. But just know this. It is, it is infinitely better to go through pain with messy friends than with no friends at all. All right? So don't let the devil dupe you. Don't hold it against them and let that seed of bitterness take root Don't replay the conversation and just punish them again and again. If you have to talk to them about it, talk to them and then extend to them the same forgiveness and grace that God has extended to you. That's the beauty about being a Christian. We have received so much forgiveness from Jesus. Those of us who are aware of our sins, we realize 
Like if Jesus gave us a 10,000th chance, we'd still need more. And yet he forgives and he forgives and he forgives and he forgives. And that's so good for us. And it prepares us to extend that forgiveness for them. So thank God that they showed up. Forgive them for their sins. And don't let the devil mess with the community that is a necessity after our tragedy. So, final question. What you gonna do? <laughs> That's gonna land in different spots for all of us, but like who's the person? What's the step? What, what's the f- forgiveness you need to embrace or to extend? The, the message you need to, to send or to receive? Here's what I'm super grateful for. In this broken world, you and I are not alone. And the stronger our roots get here, like I, I know you can believe in Jesus all by yourself, but how, how good is it when the bottom falls off? You have this. You have a church, a pastor, a group, friends who know God, love God, and love you. That's how we get through it together. Uh, that's what Mike told me. Uh, Mike is a member of our church who leads a local chapter of a program called Grief Share. It's essentially like a small group for people who have lost those that they dearly love. I knew Mike that had infinitely more experience than I did in this area, so I asked him this simple question via email. I said, Mike, does community really make a difference? Like, when you're in that spot of deep grief, does this matter or am I just like reading too much into this? And I want to put Mike's words up on the screen behind me so you can read them too. He responded, Pastor Mike, we will all grieve differently and for different lengths of time. However, there are two things in common to all. We cannot do this alone. And above all, we cannot do this without God. You cannot do this alone. And you can't do it without God. Because of Jesus and our community, we don't have to. So brothers and sisters, those of you on the highs and lows, expect it to be messy. And thank God for Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for grace. I'm rethinking all those conversations with uh, the amazing people at our church, wondering what I could have done better, what I should have said, what I shouldn't have said. Thank you that I, that we can, can think about those conversations without ending up with so much shame and guilt that it just keeps us up. Thank you, Jesus, that when you went to the cross, you said, it is finished. And, and you thought of all of it. Like, all the sins and In the highest highs and lowest lows, you paid for all of them. We are so grateful for your unfailing love. Now, Heavenly Father, I'm asking for your spirit for all of us. Uh, Some of us are going to take some huge steps, some momentous moments in the days to come, and we need your spirit to guide us and give us wisdom. Father, you, you said in the book of James that if any of us lacks wisdom, if we just don't know what to do, we should ask you and not doubt, and you will give it abundantly and generously. So we're, we're praying big today, God. Make us brilliant at this. Like if, if a thought comes into our mind and it's not beneficial, like put a lump in our throat so we can't speak. If a Bible passage we haven't thought of in forever is perfect for that moment, bring it to our memory, to our hearts that we could speak and not just sympathize, but bring comfort through your word. Finally, Jesus, we, we pray for patience. Uh, The Bible says that the only reason you haven't come back yet to end this brokenness is because you love people who are not here just yet. People who still have doubts. People who question you. People who don't believe that you died for the forgiveness of their sins. They matter so much to you, God, that you're still waiting. And so we pray for patience. Help us to love each other well, to serve each other well in the moments until you come back and there's no more mourning and no more crying and no more death and no more divorce, and no more depression. The brokenness will be gone, the old ways will be passed, and the new will come. We ache for that day. And we know that you're going to get us there. 
So inspire us, God. Forgive us. Lead us as we race to the finish line where we see your face and pain is gone forever. We pray this all with confidence because of your glorious son. And all God's people said, amen.